Good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Famarkas, and today I'll be taking through my team's digital journey over the last five years. I've been working at Geoscience Australia for the last 11 years. From the first day, I was instantly drawn to the subject matter. Working in an organisation where people are so passionate about their work is inspiring. My current roles are technical and team lead, iteration manager, and my greatest passion, which is still software engineering. I can honestly say I love my job, as this is a wonderful place to work, and we've come a long way, especially in the technology space. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful people who make up my team. There's Arby, Andrew, Callum, Deepika, Ed, Gang, Lee, Mamadul, Ruben and Tony. And recently we also had three new starters, which is Kim, Asaf and Ishan. When I inherited the team back in 2016, there were three people in total looking after a handful of applications. And by inherit, I mean I was asked to act in the role for three weeks and I'm still here. Now we're in a team of 14 people and we're soon to be 15. We look after over 20 digital products with 100 source code repositories and we also look after 40% of the agency's Amazon Web Services accounts as well. So I don't like to disrespect the work done in the past, so I want to put a caveat to say that they did the best they could with the tools and hardware they had available at the time. However, in saying that, the early days of web applications uh, in GA had high failure rates. Downtime was a common theme as they'll run on a, uh, on a single virtual machine with fixed computing power and memory, and we could not scale during peak periods and emergencies. Our digital reputation was questionable, as every time there was a decent earthquake in Australia, the application would go down and Twitter would light up about it. Um, I remember early iterations of Sentinel, which is our bushfire monitoring application, and we would require someone 24 by 7 to keep the system up during peak periods. Applications were slow to load, and they had no mobile compatibility. The change control process was slow and lacked quality control. A simple bug fix could take two to three weeks to go to production, and every change had to go through a change approval board. Releases were nearly guaranteed to cause downtime, and sometimes for days. The, de the development and production servers were different specifications, and the de deployment process was resource intensive. The most de demoralising aspect, however, was the culture in IT. At the time, we were nested in the business and not in IT. Developers were not allowed read access to production logs, and we were openly told we cannot be trusted. And some days, it would take over three days to get a copy of a log when there was an important production issue we needed to resolve. We were also not allowed any administration access to our desktop, so we could not install any useful tools by the book. I was always put forward with the argument that we have an APS code of conduct to abide by, and that should be enough to trust us. So this is a stark contrast to where we are today. We have rapid development time working in an agile manner. We have a high release frequency with zero downtime deployments, and some days we can do up to 30 releases. This is the very definition of continuous integration. We have a low change failure rate. Rarely do issues make it to production, and if they do, they are minor, and we fix forward instead of rolling the changes back. System uptime is 99%, as advertised by Amazon Web Services, which I'll be re referring to as AWS during the talk. Our portals can support 250,000 users per second, which is 15 million users a minute. Um, and developers can now install software, and crazily enough, we have proven we don't abuse that privilege. So the big question is, how do we get here? So the most important transformation was shifting the culture. One key element is team dynamics, and by that I mean psychological safety, dependability. Team members feel that their work has a meaningful impact on the agency, and as a team leader, this is your responsibility to create the culture. You don't get to blame upwards or down use, this is 100% on you. You need to empower your team and create a high trust culture and this will automatically lead to a higher performing team. An interesting fact is that people, people from high performing teams are 2.2 times more likely to recommend their workplace as an excellent place to work. So innovation is risk taking. If you're in a team that when something goes wrong you're punished for it, how likely are you to take risks in the future? You're not going to take risks, and this is also going to stifle innovation. How you develop software matters. The right tools is not enough. You need the right culture as well. Unfortunately, IT has a high burnout rate, so getting the right balance is important. If you get all of the above right, you'll have happy staff, which in turn make happy software. A great saying is, you can't change the world, but you can make a small corner of it nicer. As leaders, it is our responsibility not only in our behaviours, but also our policies and procedures should not increase anxiety. And if you can make life just a bit easier for your staff, then at the end of the workday, they are heading home happier people to their family and friends, and in turn, you're making the world a better place. 
So Agile is a process by which a team can manage a project by breaking it up into several stages involving constant collaboration with stakeholders and continuous improvement and iteration at every stage. The Agile Manifesto now is 20 years old. We had already started our Agile journey when I took over the team. We had been doing all the common principles like program increments, uh, sprints and daily stand-ups. We have our sprint planning meetings on the first day of every sprint where our wonderful product owners will attend and plan their work. We have reached a level of Agile maturity where our completion rate is about 80 to 90 per cent. We have cultivated excellent working relationships with our product owners. This is critical as they are also the business analysts and testers for the digital products. Most people think that you must follow the textbook implementation of Agile. You know, you get the Agile consultant in and they tell you how to be, how to be Agile. I believe that's a fallacy. For example, we used to do sprint reviews at the end of the sprint. This was great at the beginning of our journey, but after a while it offered no value as we had refined our workflow, so we cut it out. The lesson here is to tailor the parts of the Agile methodology that work for your team. After all, Agile means the ability to move quickly and easily. So one of the greatest tools we utilise for the Agile methodology is JIRA. JIRA allows us to plan, track and report our sprints and program increments. For any given sprint, we have over 100 tasks defined, so a team workflow is critical. This also gives transparency to all the stakeholders and anyone in the organisation. They can track the progress and status of their projects. We, can also capture, we also capture all the business requirements and decisions in JIRA. We also use it for our change control approvals for production as well. So I'll run you through the workflow. So a developer will get a task from the to-do column and they'll move it to in progress. Once they have completed their work, they'll move it to in review and assign it to the product owner or tester for review. Once the review is complete, the product owner will either put rework comments in there or approve for production. They will then move it to review complete and assign it back to the developer. If the JIRA is approved for production, then the change will be deployed and the JIRA resolved. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Otherwise, the developer will rework and the iterative cycle continues. My team updates their task daily at 4pm to increase transparency. If a task is in review for three consecutive days, it gets removed to blocked. If no action is taken by the end of the sprint, it gets moved to the blocked backlog. And this re then requires the product owner to attend another sprint planning session to plan that task again. So as part of the JIRA workflow, my team tracks the time spent on each ticket. This way we get real-time insights at how the projects are tracking. We report on time spent by project, time spent by epics, and how long each task is taking. You'll notice a common theme, which is transparency. We want our products and management to have full transparency of our work. So five years ago, I embarked on a journey and vision to take GA's digital products and make them world class. My goal was that the portals had to have a consistent look and feel that followed the corporate style guide and made users feel like they were in the same ecosystem. Previously in GA, you would struggle to find two applications that looked the same, and each time you had to work out how to use them. Whether someone clicks on an earthquake or a bushfire hotspot, the behaviour should be the same and give you informative, easy to understand data. When a requirement comes my way, I always have my one GA hat on and I'm always thinking how can this benefit all of the agency. We use open source technologies like Angular for the web application framework and OpenLays for the two-dimensional mapping. These are backed by large communities and this also greatly reduces licensing costs. We have also built a common Angular library which all the portals utilise. All, all the common components live in this library and this saves development time and reduces code duplication. Having the portals use the same code base means we greatly reduce the cost of development. For instance, if GA decides to update their colour scheme, we only need to make a change in the common library, then it's just a matter of updating the library version and redeploying all the portals. Recently I upgraded all the portals from Angular 10 to 11 in a single day. This also forces us to reduce our technical debt by upgrading all the portals simultaneously, as they're all on the same versions and we never leave um, one behind. The portals themselves are about $50 a month to run on cloud, and that's including a web application firewall. So our goal is that our application should work on any supported browser and any device. Our main purpose is to deliver digital science to the public. The portals have to be dynamic for any screen resolution as well. I remember one of the product owners saying to me, we don't need Feature X to work on mobile. So being an Aries and stubborn, I built it to work on mobile anyways. Not long after, I was able to demonstrate via analytics that 60% of the people were using this feature on mobile devices. So the Exploring for the Future program has been by far the greatest investment in our portals and has enabled us to significantly enhance our portal technology. 
We came up with a concept of a persona, you can see four of them there, um, where the Geoscience Australia portal can reskin, rebrand and reconfigure the entire application on the fly. All, is, all of this is done via a configuration file without writing a single line of code. We can even host it on a custom domain. Personas are a great way for our business areas to get their data out utilising any suite of tools or functionality without the development costs associated with it. Several tools built in EFTF now reside in many other portals. So now we have this newly found cross-collaboration amongst business, business areas in the portal space as well. So we've also been venturing into the 3D space on the browser. Most 3D is done on the desktop, which is easy to do. On the browser, we have a lot more limitations. So what you can see here, starting from the top left and in a, going in a clockwise direction, we have historic earthquakes since the 1600s. We have Cobar geological surfaces, airborne electromagnetic data in the Northern Territory, and the Australian crustal boundaries. Our biggest challenge is waiting for browsers to catch up and smaller devices to have better hardware and memory. We have over 17,000 layers in the Geoscience Australia portal, of which 11,000 are 3D layers. And there are several subsurface data sets available. And recently we have been implementing elevation LiDAR point cloud data, which will be available soon as well. So we also build many non-spatial portals, which are used to deliver scientific data, like geomagnetism, geodetic calculators, to name a few. I'll touch on this a bit later. The spatial and non-spatial portals all share the same common library as well. So, like the old days, we could spend six months building a new portal for each of the 15 products we have, or we can spend 15 minutes using our common library to build a base portal, and the rest of the time invested in digital science and building custom tools. Geoscience Australia is a very niche agency, and you can rarely find an off-the-shelf library for a large percentage of the requirements. The following graphs are from the Petroleum Source Rock tool in the Geoscience Australia portal. So now it's time for some Petroleum 101 from a software developer. I apologise to Simon van der Will in advance if I get this wrong. So organic content measured as total organic carbon in the sedimentary rocks are heated up when it is buried. Oil is formed between 65 and 150 degrees Celsius and gas is formed between 90 and 250 degrees Celsius. The first plot you see here shows whether the organic content is a good petroleum source and whether the organic matter in the rock is likely to be converted to gas or oil. The second plot is a group box and whiskers plot and it shows the variations in gas composition from different basins and sub-basins. The third plot discriminates types of organic material in the rock and whether it has been through the oil and gas window. Plots one and three help the scientists to know if the rocks are a good source of hydrocarbons, one of the main questions when doing a petroleum system assessment. Plot two summarises the composition of gas with different fields. High concentrations of carbon dioxide is bad. Uh, methane is used for generation of electricity. Ethane and propane is a feedstock for plastics. In the past, these types of plots took months to prepare and they were a snapshot in time. Now we have the ability to produce them dynamically with the latest data in a matter of seconds. So as an APS agency, we must adhere to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which contain four main principles. Perceivable, we have to provide text alternatives for non-text content like images. We have to make it easy for users to see and hear things. For example, we embed text that you don't see, however the screen readers pick it up. It has to be operable. Users can navigate with the forms with a keyboard. We don't use content that can cause seizures. For instance, we make sure the map pans slowly when we do animations. We help users navigate and find content. We're in the process of building an artificial intelligence chatbot to also help users guide in the GA portal. Understandable, text has to be readable. For instance, we use a minimum font size of 13 pixels anywhere in applications. We use colourblind safety ramps, like in Digital Earth Australia hotspots, which I'll demonstrate soon. And error messages need to be useful for the user. And finally, robust. We have to maximise compatibility with the current and future user agents, including some assistive technologies. So thanks to the advent of smartphones, a user's attention span, a span has halved. So everyone expects Google-like performance. One of the key reasons the Google search page has a very basic design is for performance. People will not tolerate a slow spatial portal that takes seconds to load, and nor should they. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury with spatial portals as we have to load the map tiles as well. However, we've still managed to achieve sub-second load times for most of our portals. So a Google search page loads in about 500 milliseconds, and Earthquake Search EA loads in 700 milliseconds. In this game, we chase millisecond improvements for performance gains. With Angular's ahead-of-time compiler, the browser downloads a pre-compiled version of the application. 
The browser loads the executable code so you can render the application immediately without waiting for the app to compile first. The head of time compiler also compiles the HTML templates and co components into JavaScript files long before they are served to your web browser. With no templates to read and no risky client-side HTML or JavaScript evaluation, there are fewer opportunities for security injection attacks. Angular has a really neat compilation tool called tree shaking. A tree shaker basically walks through the dependency tree top to bottom and shakes out any unused code like dead leaves on a tree. This in turn reduces the bundle size to increase the faster load time for the user. We also utilize a concept called lazy loading where we can split our application to feature modules and load them only on demand. For memory profiling, memory, we will do memory profiling, which identifies memory leaks and memory churn that can lead to startup, freezes, and even the application crashing. As Angular, increases to, as Angular continues to increase the performance of their compilers, the applications will only get faster. For example, the latest version of Angular reduced the load times by 20%. My goal was always to build some of the fastest loading spatial porters in the world, and I can confidently say my team has achieved this feat. So we can generate a visualisation using Webpack to see which components are contributing to the most size of our bundles. One of the main, once the main bundle starts to increase, the performance goes down exponentially because every kilobyte extra on the main bundle is contributing to slower performance. As mentioned earlier, we use several open source libraries and it is critical we continue to track the bundle size as the application grows. Down the bottom in the middle, you can see the Flying Hellfish Common Library, which I referenced earlier. The bundle illustrated here belongs to Earthquakes of GA and its total bundle size is 9 megabytes. However, in its compressed format, it's down to 700 kilobytes, which is what you get, which is the size that when you download it comes to your browser. So the compressed bundle, which is what gets downloaded by the user, means faster download times and reduced costs for data transfer. So cloud comes along and we're already well on our agile journey. At the, at the same time, there's a shift in culture from upper management in IT, as I remember the CEO at the time telling me to ask for forgiveness and not permission, which is a vast contrast to when I first started. Cloud enables us to perform rapid prototyping to try new technologies, and most importantly, to fail fast, which is a key agile principle and all this at a very low cost. Innovation is now limited by your imagination. We're no longer limited to on-premise server infrastructure, which can only support fixed software versions. My team does not have innovation days. My team has the freedom and expectation to innovate on a daily basis. Cloud is cost effective. So you would have the term serverless. It means that we no longer have to run servers 24 hours a day. We're only paying for the seconds of execution and we do not have to worry about provisioning and managing the servers ourselves. We utilise serverless everywhere we can. Where we, do not run, where we do have to run servers, you get the advantage of reserved instances, which means paying up front for a discounted rate. This is great for known workloads like earthquakes at GA. We also do things like putting servers to sleep out of business hours for non-production environments. And what's really cool is we use serverless to actually put the servers to sleep and wake them. Reliability has been excellent with a 99% uptime, and knowing the Australian Cyber Security Centre has awarded protected certification to AWS for 42 of their cloud services gives us great confidence. Scalable, it means we can build today with tomorrow in mind. We can cater for anticipated growth of the applications. For instance, our Earthquakes application, we run in three servers, so we're running three servers, each in different availability zones, so think of three different physical locations in Sydney. This means that if there's a problem in one zone, then the traffic is automatically diverted to a healthy zone. This is part of the self-healing component of cloud. So during peak periods, we can scale from three to 10 servers in a matter of minutes. We also have our, at our disposal a vast array of server specifications to meet our demands. So when I started at GA, we had six separate positions for the listed skill sets you see here. And they have now morphed into six roles for each developer. It's not that we didn't have the skill sets, we just didn't have the mechanism to demonstrate our capabilities. If you want to operate at a high level, you can no longer be a nine to five developer and do a few training courses during work hours. The technology space is moving so fast, they need to invest your personal time in it as well. The hyper automation of cloud computing, which allows us to dynamically provision hardware, sets talent free to transition into new roles and in turn helps drive business outcomes. Inspiration was taken by analyzing how companies like Netflix operate or operate, and realising that automation is the only pathway to success. So automation has been driving the entire IT industry forward for the last few years. NIOPS is the quest for fully automated IT operations. There are two, two 
two key components that act as a foundation for knowledge, automation and cloud. Automation also promises higher effectiveness, especially in the operations and maintenance space. Traditionally, a developer would hand over the code to the operations team to administer and deploy the software. My team have adopted the knowledge methodology, which means we're also responsible for the entire life cycle of the application from design to decommissioning. We take great pride in this aspect and have proven to the product owners how serious we are about showcasing their work through building and maintaining the highest quality applications that heavily utilise automation where applicable. Advantages are the people with the most intimate knowledge of the system run and administer the system. We make sure that there are no single points of failure and at minimum at least two people across any component. The goal is to reach a certain level of automation after which the operations team is no longer needed. Remember early on when I spoke about how we weren't allowed read access to logs and now we are running the whole system successfully. So a bit of background, Amazon's CloudFront is a content delivery network. So that provides a globally distributed network of proxy servers with cached content. Amazon has 215 CloudFront Edge locations and our portals are cached at, each of the, at all of these locations. When a user hits our portal, the content is downloaded from the closest Edge location to their device. CloudFront can handle 250,000 users a second and this is a default account quota set by AWS, however this can also be increased. So Earthquakes at GA is one of two mission critical applications that my team look after. This was my first cloud implementation and it was launched in May of 2017. We had already been maintaining the existing Earthquakes application, so we knew the application very well. However, we also lacked an understanding of how our users utilised our systems as there were no metrics to design it off. The graph you see visualised on the left is what the load balancer looks like after the 7.2 magnitude earthquake in the band of C and the red circle shows you the felt radius. A load balancer is a device that distributes the traffic to the servers. So the load balancer goes from 1,000 hits to 8,000 in under two minutes and the new servers are not ready yet to handle the burst in traffic. So you may have heard of the term auto-scaling. This means that let's say when a CPU gets to 90%, we scale in new servers for the demand. What we realised was we cannot auto-scale new servers in the time required. You can't say to the Australian public, hey, if you can please wait three minutes after an earthquake for the service to spin up, and that would be great. So the first decent earthquake that came along post-launch of our new system, and the system started to perform slowly. This is quite bruising to the ego, as you've put so much work in and you think it's all going to work well. At this point, you're questioning your career decisions, as it's IT and it's just non-stop curveballs being thrown at you every which way. However, you need to be agile in your architecture and be willing to adapt and change. So by the next day, we had re-architected the recent earthquakes you see when you first load the portal. The data used to come directly from the servers and we have now changed it so it's read from a file that sits on CloudFront on the cache, so hence you get the same 250,000 users per second performance as the portal. So the servers are used when, the, when you need to perform searches and things like our public subscription feeds. We also discovered that auto-scaling off the load balancer gives a better indication that an earthquake has occurred. In the graph you can see a trough then another peak. We also learned that we need to scale the servers down very slowly as we need to cater for things like aftershocks or users um, being delayed in reporting the earthquake in the web page. So if you build modular architecture like we do, then when there is an issue, you can replace the module with a different service within days as demonstrated above. There is a fairy tale ending as since those initial issues, the system has run flawlessly for years. So Google Analytics is one of the most popular digital analytics software. It's a free web analytics service that allows us to analyse in depth detail about our users to our portals. We have configured Google Analytics on all our portals. This enables us to collect statistics like what country the user is in, what device they are using and which features they are using. We also utilise Google Tag Manager to configure new events we want to track. Only a few years ago, it meant we had to write code for every event we wanted to track. We can do it via the Tag Manager user interface now. Collecting analytics provides valuable insights that can help us to shape the future of an application and also metrics like how successful a new feature is being utilised. So Digital Earth Australia Hotspots, which is our bushfire hotspot monitoring application, was launched in October 2019 at the start of the black summer bushfire season. We had, a, we had an exceptionally high uptake of the new web services. It was exactly the same data, however I had managed to convince the businesses to switch from fire iconography to a heat map. We ended up serving over 1 billion hits to our web services. 
To give you a perspective, the 2021 fire season, we only served about 80 million requests. So we built the EA hotspots in three months with three senior developers, Cal and Tony and myself. This was an epic feat as it was a full stack redevelopment. We were also under the assumption that we were just modernising the existing cloud infrastructure to meet my team's cloud best practices. When we began migrating the data, we soon realised that the data structures in the database were problematic and we knew there was going to be some 70, 80 hour work, work weeks ahead. We still met our deadline without compromising quality and, and the application was launched for the first week of the bushfire season. However, after a few weeks of having the application live, we started experiencing high traffic and the system was not performing optimally. So this is the architecture diagram for DEA hotspots. This demonstrates the complexity of these systems, as this is only a subset of the full diagram. So this application has three tiers. It has a secure authenticated tier for emergency services only, a tier for the public user interface, and a tier for the public web services. They all shared a large database, so if there was a high demand, it would affect all three tiers. So I spent a week researching a new solution with multiple databases. However, it had a lot of duplication and was not an optimal solution. The Friday morning I was due to deploy my new solution, I had a discussion with my product owner, Simon Oliver, and he said to me, have you looked at RDS uh, database read replicas as a solution? Now you would be a fool not to listen to the technical expertise your product owners may offer, as they understand the technical space quite well, especially in GA. I had read about read replicas before, however I thought they had some limitations, so I did some further investigation and realised they were a much better solution than what I had come up with. And they, could not rep and they could replicate the data in 200 milliseconds. So being agile, I ditched a week worth of changes, rolled back my non-production environment using automated pipelines. By that afternoon, we had deployed the new architecture, which each tier had its own read replica databases, as you can see illustrated. The change was done with no downtime, as what, as what we do, we bring up new servers and wait until they're in a healthy state. Then the load balancer directs the traffic to the new servers, then it will terminate the old servers meaning there's no downtime for the user. The best part about this solution is out of the fire season, we can, that out of fire season, we can scale the database read replicas back to reduce cost. During the black summer bushfires, we were running 20 to 30 servers constantly. We usually only run about eight. For instance, during the 2021 bushfire season, no additional read replicas were required, only the baseline of one for each tier that we run. If you ran the hardware required on premise, it would cost a mint for an event that happens every few years. This is where cloud has its clear advantages. We also found that our cache was not optimally tuned and we were only caching about 6% of the web service requests. After tuning the cache, we reached 70%. Remember earlier when I mentioned the 215 CloudFront edge locations? The web service requests also sit on this cache mentioned, also sit on this cache, which in turn reduced the burden on the servers and the databases as well. And this was another fairy tale ending as the read replica, so after the read replica solution was implemented, we didn't have any issues for the rest of that fire season. So load testing allows us to, to test the performance of the application. We use Gatling frontline distributed load testing, which can be purchased from the AWS marketplace. Our non-production and production environments are mirrors of each other, except for the server sizes. The advantage of cloud is we can alter the server size to match production and run the load test in non-production knowing it will produce exactly the same results as the production environment. We simulated 20 million users hitting the home page in three minutes. The test was done in December 2019 when the fires were getting bad and there was 180,000 hotspots being returned from the web service in that three day period. The final result was 95% of the requests returned in an average of 13 milliseconds and 99% of, of the requests returned in 234 milliseconds. A load test of this size only costs about $300, which is invaluable. You may not be able to do this on premise, and if you could, you would likely have some very unhappy IT administrators looking for you. Validating your work is critical. Design principles and real world usage don't always align. So one of the most rewarding parts of my job is knowing that the systems we build can assist in the safety of the community. On the left, you can see the rural, fire, rural firefighting service using our hotspots web service, and on the right, you can see the National Aerial Firefighting Centre and the flight paths of their aircraft. We have a great fun culture in my team and there is plenty of banter. However, we take our job very seriously and we always aim to design the highest caliber systems as you just never know who is relying on your data. So the security threat landscape is always growing. Security is always our number one thought process when designing any architecture or writing any code. 
The Australian Signals Director released the Essential 8. This is a series of baseline mitigation strategies which we always aim to comply with. In the cloud space, we mitigate risk by the following. So we do nightly server patching, we do automated secure key rotation, we have web application firewalls on all our portals and they protect against things like SQL injection and cross-site scripting attacks. We encrypt our databases, any data stored in a file store or in any systems, and our application credentials. Denial of service attack protection, which you may know as DDoS. We have strict granular security policies. We log all traffic coming in so we can identify an issue and if needed we can rapidly block any threats with a firewall. And we also did ethical hacking. So ethical hacking is legally attempting to break into application to test its defences. We hired ionized to perform ethical ha hacking on Digital Earth Australia hotspots and we received an excellent result back as they were unable to breach the system. We received two minor recommendations which were implemented within two hours of receiving the report. This is the advantage of agile and automation, change is rapid. So my team look after 50 AWS accounts and we have hundreds of services running in all these accounts. We needed a way to scan all the accounts and confirm that only resources that my team implemented exist. So I built a serverless function on Lambda that runs hourly and scans all the available regions, some of which you see visualised here on the globe. If there are any findings, they are reported to our, to our SecOps channel, which you can see illustrated at the bottom. Um, so here you see that in Earthquakes non-production, the AWS Systems Manager Parameter Store has a parameter called Slack Topic ARN in the Sydney region that does not have the correct tags. You have to be careful that you're also not creating a new security risk by reporting too many details over the line to Slack. For instance, we strip out the account ID. So every single AWS resource must have the correct tags that match my team's tagging standard. This is a great way to automatically enforce standards, find unauthorised resources in the case of a breach, and any unused resources that were manually created, for instance. I also extended this recently to check for any open ports, so SSH port 22, and check that keys have automated rotation enabled as well. This is critical, as in AWS, all the services are locked down by default, so if there's a security breach, it's on you. The tagging standard I mentioned above, I only put in late last year. It's never too late to go back and implement a standard, however, I would recommend considering a standard from day one. So governance is critical, as we are obliged to audit business decisions and system changes by the Australian National Audit Office. However, this does not mean that it has to be an onerous process and make everyone cringe at the word change control. You need to document standards and workflows and keep them as live documents. This is one of the key reasons my team has scaled without causing me anxiety. The first thing a new starter will receive is copies of my best practice document, our style guide and the team's workflow. We have automated pipelines which reduce the risk of human error. We have an integrated development environment, which is where we write the code, set to auto format our code on save for consistency. I also require my team to put at least a one line comment minimum above each function. We use static analysis, which checks for readability, maintainability and functional errors. And all code must have a minimum of 80 to 90% unit test code coverage. You would be surprised at the efficacy of bugs picked up by the automated unit tests. I mentioned JIRA earlier. At any point, there are about 300 tasks in my sprint board, and under 10% are defects, and they are low priority. This is why quality control matters. The common library is not allowed to have any known defects. They must be addressed immediately as well. We also use end-to-end -end unit testing, and this varies from unit testing, as unit testing basically hits the mock services. End-to-end -end testing simulates a user running through the entire application and actually hitting the real service and verifying the results returned. So one of our change control gates are pull requests. So pull requests are a mechanism for a developer to notify team members that they have completed a feature that needs to be reviewed. The benefits are they are reviewed by the team and not an external party that doesn't understand the consequences of the changes. Strict coding standards, as per the governance I mentioned about before. We have an opportunity to share knowledge with other team members and it creates a healthy competitive environment where you don't want to make mistakes as you may get memes created about you. If you've worked on one portal, you can basically work on any as the code is very similar. So after visiting the AWS Summit in Las Vegas in 2017, I attended many talks by companies like Netflix and I was able to gauge what the rest of the world was doing. For on-premise deployments, I would still follow the change approval board process. However, for cloud, it was time for a change, so I designed the following workflow. You can see pictured here. 
And I can tell you this was met with intense resistance and it was debated for years to come. I remember overhearing being called a cowboy several times for trying to do this outlandish thing called innovation. However, I built a strong enough case as to how flawed the current change control process was. For instance, I would say things like drop the database in the rollback strategy and I even put windings in the business reason and guess what, they both got approved. So all of our systems have two environments, non-production and production, to reduce the blast radius in case there's a security breach. In the source code repos repositories, we have two main branches, develop and master. So develop corresponds to non-production, as you can see if you follow the line, and master corresponds to production. Uh, similarly, if you follow the line across, you can see. So to run you through this workflow, so a developer will create a feature branch from develop, once they complete their work, they will raise a pull request. This requires one other developer in my team to review and approve this pull request. Once it has been approved, this can then be merged into the develop branch, which will automatically kick off the Bitbucket pipeline. And the pipeline will run static analysis, it will run unit testing, and if those two pass, then it will run the Angular build and finally it will deploy it to the non-production environment as well. So the developer will then assign the Jira to the product owner for review, once it has been reviewed and the product owner has to state with the exact text that it's approved for production, then the developer raises a pull request from the develop to the master branch. This pull request then requires two other team members to approve the pull request, plus the product owner's permission in JIRA. Once we have all three, the branch can be merged and this once again kicks off an automated pipeline, which does, once again, it'll run static analysis, unit tests, and they have to pass. It will build Angular and then it will deploy it to the production AWS account. At this snapshot in time, the develop and master branch and the non-production and production environment are mirrors of each other. So another tool we recently installed was Sonicube and this automatically runs as part of our deployment pipelines. So Sonicube scans the code base to find bugs, security vulnerabilities and technical debt and also does some WK compliance and gives you a pretty simple A to E rating. We also plan on granting access to this console to all our product owners so they have full transparency of the system's current state. So the image you see here is, it, is from the Economic Fairways tool in the Geoscience Australia portal and it's generated using BlueCap, which is a geospatial model to assess regional economic viability for mineral resource development. Simplifying the change control process also makes external collaborations easier. So Stuart Walsh from Monash University, who initially wrote the BlueCap software, then we've got Marcus Haynes from the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division who has also been contributing and working on the software project and my team who host the infrastructure and build an API to talk to BlueCap. So all three parties use pull requests and the same change control process mentioned earlier. This has also become a common pattern for my team where scientists write the algorithms and my team hosts the infrastructure. We build an API to talk to it and any required delivery mechanisms. So GA has this terrible habit of collecting technical debt. I'd say it rivals our fossil collection at the entrance of the building. <laughs> Luckily, this financial year, we had two resources dedicated to modernising modernizing these archaic-looking applications. The application looked like this up until a few months ago. The scientific algorithm, algorithm which was written in the C language, it was last modified in 2015. So finding the source code was challenging in itself. Luckily, we are skilled in many coding languages. I was able to convert the code to return JSON instead of HTML. I then built an API in AWS to host the C code. This is what's great about the cloud. We retain the core scientific component and modernised infrastructure to interact with it. It now has a common look and feel as our other form-based portals. We put the same amount of effort and quality into all our portals as you never know how important they may be and for instance, we only recently found out that the Civil Aviation Safety Authority recommend the Sunrise Sunset application you see here for pilots. So infrastructure as code is the process of managing and provisioning infrastructure through software, rather than physical hardware configuration or interactive configuration tools. We use Terraform for our infrastructure as code. Terraform is an open source infrastructure as code software tool. The image you see here is the code to build an auto-scaling group. Because this is code, it is checked into our source code repository, so we retain the history of the application as well. Another advantage is 99% of the stack is built programmatically via automated pipelines, so this also reduces human error. Each application has its own disaster recovery document as well. All of the above means we can restore a stack in under one hour from scratch. No portal can be released to production without a disaster recovery document and an architecture diagram as well. 
So all of, all of this automation means we need a mechanism to report everything. We utilise Slack and it has excellent integrations for Jira and Bitbucket. We have several Slack channels for our notifications. With so many tools, we needed automated notifications. So starting at the top left, here we can see that Dipika has created a pull request and you can see the reviews are already configured. If a pull request has been not actioned within a few minutes, Dipika can nudge the team as we don't want to slow our teammates down as well. So the second image top right indicates the first message that Ed's pipeline failed. Then we can see that Ruben commented on a task and then the last one is Ed's pipeline running successfully. The bottom left, we can see the earthquake's DevOps channel. We can see that an earthquake failed to be ingested into the database with an error message stating why. The wonderful part is the earthquakes alert center are instantly notified at the same time that we are once again continuing the theme of transparency. The bottom right indicates that there's a CloudWatch alarm in AWS raised for a server because it has a high CPU and memory. We also tra track things like AWS account limits and any other configured alarms. So earlier I mentioned high performing teams. This is, a, this is measurable in software engineering. Your lead time to changes, so commit to code deploy in under an hour. Release frequency has to be on demand. Time to restore, under one hour. And your change failure rate has to be less than 15%. So the metrics are set by the state of DevOps report and I can happily say that my team meet all four criteria. So lessons learned. So automation is your friend. Don't think you'll script yourself out of a job. You'll find much cooler things to work on. Create a culture that embraces failure. Stop punishing failures. We should be rewarding it because at the end of the day, that person taught us something really important about our system that we can address and improve. The IT company Etsy rewards the individual for the biggest production outage of the year. I have Spartan heritage and I managed to create good culture, so it's definitely possible. Creating processes early and evolve them. Processes must be agile and move with the times. Be willing to change your views based on learnings as well. So I'd like to thank my team for all their wonderful work and the immense passion they have for software engineering and the never ending search for excellence. All my managers, current and in the past, who have helped me to learn and grow. And I'd also like to thank all the wonderful business areas that put faith in my team to showcase their amazing work. That concludes our journey, so I'd like to thank you all for your time, and I hope this has been an informative session. My team's email is below, so please feel free to contact us if you'd like to know more.